On Throwback Thursday, maybe a little clarification of a dispute. Who was the youngest person ever hired by the CBC Radio Network in Toronto? Well, Ken Haslam's obituary says it was he. It doesn't say what age, it just says he was the youngest. Well, I did my interview at age 24, I was transferred here at 25, so I say it was I who was the youngest. Now since Ken Haslam is dead, he doesn't get to argue the point. I worked with Ken, and I don't think he'd mind. Here's an interview from Ontario Morning, Peter Sturzberg, who wrote the book about Lester Pearson, and it's very interesting to see, as I look back on some of the issues, NORAD, NATO, alliances, things that are in the news today. And one thing I mention is the cost of that book was 1995, and that was considered outrageous in the early 80s. There's a new book out about Lester Pearson. It not only shows Canadians how much pride we should have in this Prime Minister, Nobel Prize winner, and international statesman, but also tells us about the problems of trying to run a middle power country next door to a superpower such as America. Peter Sturzberg's latest book is Lester Pearson and the American Dilemma. Using the interview technique, he has also done two books about Diefenbaker and another about Pearson. Mr. Stur Sturzberg's here this morning. Good morning. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Pearson's international reputation was fabulous. I wasn't aware of it. He was offered the Danish foreign ministry <laughs> one time, wasn't he? Well, I think that was a joke more than anything. <laughs> but I loved his reply. <laughs> yes. Uh, what did he say? He said, I'd be I'll become the Danish foreign minister if I don't have to leave Canada, can remain a, a Canadian citizen, and <laughs> something else. He put outrageous uh, stipulations on it. I want to talk about, uh, you relate an instance where Kennedy really wanted to talk to Pearson mm -hmm. about uh, things of an international nature. And I hear he, Pearson gets a phone call. And uh, was it Kennedy on the other line who said, do you have a, gre a degree from Harvard? Do you have one from Princeton? Pearson, Pearson well, kept answering you, yes. The reason it was that, uh, that Pearson didn't want to meet Kennedy. Uh, during an election campaign. You see, there had been uh, this uh, business of uh, Kennedy interfering in the election of 1962 and 1963 against Diefenbaker. And uh, Pearson was very sensitive about this kind of thing. And so uh, he said that, no, he wasn't going to go to Washington to see Kennedy to advise him on on foreign affairs, because he didn't want to be uh, too closely associated with the Americans, so uh, Kennedy then uh, decided on the ploy of of giving him an honorary degree, and he asked him, uh, "Where have you got your honorary degrees? You say, have you got one from Harvard?" Have you? Yes. Well, then Boston. You haven't got one from Boston University, and he didn't have one from Boston University. Well, he said, I'm going to see that you get one from Boston University, and this is how he met him, you see, and uh, uh, and got him to, and consulted him on so, foreign affairs. In other words, if you hold out long enough, you can get a degree for talking to Kennedy. <laughs> yes, that's... <laughs> you mentioned the U.S. involvement in Canadian elections. Weren't the same advanced people and, and technicians who elected Kennedy the people who, who uh, worked on Trudeau's campaign? Uh, no, I don't think so. You mean, uh, which ones? Uh, uh, Lou Harris, you Harris mean? Harris was up. Was he on the Trudeau campaign? Well, he was up for the Pearson one for sure, wasn't yes, he? Yes, absolutely. He did the polling for the Pearson campaign. And uh, they kept it very quiet, mind you. Uh, and there's a story, I don't know whether it's in this book or in, in my other book, uh, where by uh, Keith Davey was taking... Uh, Lou Harris around and ran into a friend and introduced Harris as somebody else. <laughs> that was, yeah, that's in this book. That's a funny... Actually, the friend was a conservative. Yeah. Conservative member. How much kibitzing does America do in our elections? Well, I, I think that there is no question about it. I think this is part of the American Dilemma, of course, uh, uh, which is the title of the book, Lester Pearson and the American Dilemma. And that, uh, I think there's no doubt about it that they interfered and interfered very successfully in the 1962 and 1963 elections. Uh, I think that this was because they were really furious with uh, 
Uh, I think it was more than just Kennedy and uh, Diefenbaker not being able to get along and Kennedy and Pearson having very good relations. I think it was much more than that. I think it was uh, the fact that uh, uh, the Canadian government had attempted uh, to do things do, and did a couple of things uh, in opposition uh, to American policy. Uh, first of all, there was the Cuban. They uh, continued relations with Castro and continued trade with Castro. This was Diefenbaker did. And then there was, of course, the first sale of wheat to communist China, which broke the, um, the American embargo. And I think the Americans and the Americans made it very clear that they weren't uh, very happy about this at all. In fact, they were very angry about it. And they put all kinds of obstacles in the way of the uh, communist China trade. Uh, they, you remember, they didn't allow these pumps for the wheat. Uh, and finally, the, uh, we got them, but we had to threaten to get them. And then in the end, uh, they decided that they had to dump Diefenbaker, and they did, and they did it very successfully. Uh, so I think that uh, there's no question about it that the Americans, uh, and I think we're faced with the American dilemma right now over the cri crisis in Iran and over the uh, boycott of the Olympics. I was I surprised mm -hmm. at, at the amount of impact Canada's policy has had internationally. Uh, I suppose the, the biggest symbolic evidence of that is that we were the ones who got the hotline between Washington and Moscow, the red phone. Yes, yes. That was old Howard Green. That wasn't really Pearson. But then there is a continuity of foreign policy, which I think is brought out by this book, because the last, in the last chapter, you remember, uh, the chapter is about uh, Trudeau's attempt to put us on a neutralist course. Uh, you remember he wanted to scuttle our commitment to NATO, uh, and uh, he was opposed in this, curiously enough, by a fellow French-Canadian, Leo Cadieux, who was the uh, Minister of National Defense. And finally, Trudeau discovered, of course, after a couple of years, and after this uh, big debate there was within the cabinet, that, you know, you cannot change a country's foreign policy as easy as that. Uh, that we have to go along with NATO, that we have to go along with NORAD, that we have really, we can only argue with the Americans, we can only tell them privately, diplomatically, that uh, when we think that they're wrong, but when the chips are down, we have to stand up and be counted. Speaking of Trudeau, he's the only person who won't talk to you. Yes. Does, does yeah. he not like you, or is he trying to drum up support for his own memoirs, or what? Well, I don't, I don't know. Uh, he certainly sp talked to uh, Rodwanski, who got um, eight hours of interviews, just about the time that I was wanting to interview him. And th that was a book on Trudeau himself, and uh, uh, as you know, it was, uh, uh, you know, a book. It was almost like an official biography. Well, he's so shy and bashful, probably he, <laughs> he didn't want to talk about himself anymore. Eh? <laughs> Listen, there are a couple of problems in your book that have been cited. You, you, yeah. um, you have Canada declaring war a day early. Um, you uh, have Pearson elected, uh, or going into politics six months early, I think. Few inaccuracies like that. Are you aware of those? No, I, and uh, I don't know whether I have. Uh, you're quoting from a uh, uh, from a review of the book, uh, and the review was done by a person who also wrote a book about Pearson, and was uh, compared very unfavorably with uh, my first volume on Pearson. So who's right? <laughs> well, I don't know. I I haven't <laughs> checked it as my fact. Do you, but do I you, I would say that the re the review was a uh, you know I it's a one author. With the um, oral history technique, do you make an attempt to check these people's facts? Oh, yes, you definitely did. we did. And as a matter of fact, I had, uh, uh, I had uh, a very pr prominent member of external affairs check the whole thing. It's a good technique. It's a very mm -hmm. interesting book. Good. Thank, Thank you very you. much.
Peter Sturzberg is the author of Lester Pearson and the American Dilemma. By the way, I rarely mention the cost of books, but this one's so good, I must say it's regrettable that books have increased so much in price. In the long run, you might find $19.95 affordable if you're a Lester Pearson buff. Any views expressed here are not necessarily those of the McKenzie Institute, its speakers, sponsors, or supporters. But the Institute is dedicated to fostering public discussion, debate, and education about security matters. Google the McKenzie Institute to join the discussion. The McKenzie Institute is grateful to its sponsors and supporters. Some of our short pods and long talks are a result of the support of Heathbridge Capital Management Limited, the National Post, and Dundurn Publishing.